Today on The Tantrum Show, I'm going to interview Mike Burt. Now, Mike is the owner of K2 Distribution. But more importantly, Mike has been in the industry since the very beginning. Literally, what he doesn't know about kites, boards, whatever, you name it, isn't worth knowing. So I got the chance to pick his brains for half an hour. I learned a load of stuff on this. I'm sure you will too. We do get a little lost in detail halfway through. Some of you, the geeks like myself, will love that stuff. Some of you may find it a little bit hard going. Feel free to fast forward that bit until the end. I also have to apologise for my audio quality on this one. It tends to go up and down a little bit. I was obviously moving in and out from the microphone. This is the first time I've done this style of podcast, so it was all a bit new to me. You'll also hear me typing at the beginning. That was because I thought I had to take notes, not remembering that I was actually recording the podcast and was going to watch it back later anyway. These things happen. So without further ado, I'll jump to the podcast and I'll let Mike introduce himself. You know, I was uh, in the industry right at the very first beginnings. You know, I saw Laird Hamilton in 96, um, kite surfing with a um, converted um, ski surf thing and a, and a two-line foil kite. It's the first time I ever I ever saw kite surfing before anybody had ever seen it. Oh, you saw Laird Hamilton? Yeah, and um, that was 96. Jesus. And then we didn't, we didn't actually get a hold of a whip at the Classic until the beginning of 99. So, um, you know, I saw, I saw the um, sport sort of was created through um, the Leganau brothers. I saw it um, sort of filter out to Nash and then I saw it grow out with production through Starboard and, and all of the stuff from there, just watching all of the designers invent the new stuff and, and all of the corners that people sort of um, cut all of the inventions that nearly made it but didn't quite. Mm -hmm. I think Ben invented the first hybrid depower kite in 2005 yeah but sacked it off because it had too much bar pressure and too long a bar throw because <laughs> it wasn't a purist sea kite <laughs> it didn't have power going around corners uh -huh. and um you know that is 90 percent of the kite that we own today it then sacked it off because it didn't and and the year after that the uh, um the what do they call it? The uh, crossbow came out. Yes, crossbow. When I remember, I had that was my first kite. Well, my first proper kite, should I say. Yeah, yeah. First kite that didn't try and kill me anyway. Yeah. It's funny, funny how stuff like that, you know, happens. And the, the yeah, it's just the, the industry starts something and then throws it out and then picks it up a few years later. It's foiling. For mm -hmm. me, happened in 2002. Yeah. Um, we put it down again the year after because it was difficult and um impractical <laughs> yes yeah 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 yeah, now yeah. Look at it, you know? and now look at it it's madness it's funny it's funny you should mention that because i remember my first introduction to kite surfing actually was a chap a hitchhiker i picked up in tarifa it was when i was a windsurfer in 2004 so just yeah. before the foil just before the first crossbow came out yeah and he'd invented a kite where you zipped the center panel out so it was a 12 meter kite that you could unzip I'd four see. meters out of it and change it into an eight meter car yeah yeah and he was kind of looking for someone to promote it and sell that and, yeah. you know. i mean um rrd produced something similar right what they did was they zipped up um, a triangular wedge which turned the kite from um a hard hardcore sea kite into more of a hybrid kite right by literally bending the profile of it back mm -hmm but it never really caught on and the no. trouble is i think with zipping panels out of kites the frame is the error is the aerodynamic resistance mm -hmm. the actual material in the frame doesn't really make that much difference because you can turn it on and turn it off with right heat. okay yeah so it was kind of a concept that was doomed to failure Bless yeah and zips and sand yeah. zips salt yeah. and sand never seem to mix do they so <laughs> <laughs> Velcro maybe, but um, zips and yeah. sand I've never seen work. So one of the, the biggest questions that we get asked on the beach, especially when people are looking at buying kites and when it comes to you know talking about kites and kite design and things like this, is this huge difference that we've seen as you know from sort of 2005 between sea kites, bow kites, and now hybrid kites. Mm. And trying to explain that to people in terms that kind of you know make sense is actually is quite difficult for most you know people who've been kiting for 20 years still don't really get the differences. Could you just kind of talk us through the major differences between these kites and, and where you might want to be using each one? 
I would say that um, sea kites don't even think about unless you know what a sea kite is. It's, it's one of those things that you don't really need to know about unless um, your riding is a, a really high level. And, and then that brings you on to sort of um, the depower kites, which I call them. Kites mm -hmm. which you can turn the power off with, um, almost akin to releasing the kite on the safety leash, the depower on some of these kites is, is so extreme. Mm -hmm. Um, and as such, uh, you get um, different grades of handling within that style of kite. And largely, um, the more deep power you get, uh, the more compromise that you have in terms of sporty handling. So uh, you take something like a hybrid kite, has very good flying characteristics. It doesn't tend to have as much deep power as something that we call a delta kite or a bow kite, as we used to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you get the kites with really high levels of deep power, almost to the point at which um, the kite won't fly because it's deep powered so much, its aeronautical drag um, actually stops it from penetrating forwards in the window. And those kites are super, super safe, but ultimately one could argue a little bit um, restricted in their handling ability. And so they're brilliant for beginners. Um, and that's the sort of thing you see with the high deep power Pretty much everything these days is called a, a hybrid kite, the D-Power kites. Mm -hmm. Now, a bow kite is something that came out when D-Power kites were invented. And by bow kite, we mean something, if you look back through the history books, uh, an Airrush Halo or a Cabrina Switchblade were one of the first. Mm -hmm. They're very big, long, flat kites that the Leganau brothers invented to try and bridge the gap between a flat foil kite and an ability for it to depower and as such it was a bit of an evolutionary dead end um, but uh, there are still some old versions knocking around pretty much by and large they're consigned to history now there's very very few of them left so what you so what we're saying is basically you would classify we've got the top end of the sea kites which is kind of the very high performance the sort of formula one kites mm. of kite surfing world down to what was the bow kites which is now the hybrid kites, which we can call bottom end, not meaning bottom as in bad, but yeah, meaning yeah. bottom as in forgiving the yeah. powers a lot exactly. safe. Yeah. Okay, so that would that's a really easy way to classify it because I think the, sorry, go the on. one thing that you can kind of look at through the kites is the ability of the kite to go around a corner and still develop power is much prized within the handling characteristics of any kite. Mm -hmm. Now a sea kite is praised for its ability to turn and not reduce its power production at all. And that's why you see all these guys doing mega loops. They go up, the kite spins around and it continues lifting as it's going through the air. Now a very high deep power kite, like a Delta kite, that deep powers to almost nothing. The way that they're created and the way that they, um, the geometry of them to get that deep power stops them from developing power when they go around a corner. So you'll find like the original bandit kites from F1. When you throw a kite through the window in a straight line, it develops power. But when you turn it, the power will stop almost completely until it's finished its turn, pointing on its new angle of, um, angle of uh, sort of direction, at which point it will start moving in and developing power. So as you're flying it around the window, you get huge power spikes, and that's a bad thing. So you want, in an ideal world, the kite with the biggest amount of D power and the most consistent power delivery in a straight line versus around the corner. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because the last thing you want in the middle of a mega loop is the kite to depower oh, yeah. and you drop yeah. out of the sky. Exactly, because then you drop out of the sky. Yeah. So this is interesting because a lot of people talk to me about the dip, one of the, of the way they see it is that sea kites, and this is something I've heard time and time again, that sea kites turn faster. And it's something that I've kind of said, well, it's got nothing to do with if you measure the turning speed it's yeah. really not important it's about that power curve through the turn that's what's important yeah. turning speed is more down to the actual size of the wingtip um, interesting the the okay wing, the wingtip the faster the kite turns but the less projected area it has so it's got um it's a bit like a car bigger tires help it go around a corner faster but they produce more drag in a straight line so ultimately you've got a slower, less efficient platform that goes around corners better. Makes so perfect sense. 
it, it, you know what I mean? It, it's where you put the surface area and drag of your kite. Like race kites have very, very thin tips. Consequently, they're very slow turning, but they're unbelievably efficient in a straight line. And how do foil kites fit into all this? Because they've obviously got a very different sort yeah. Of profile. Yeah, foil kites turn not by twisting like a, a sea kite does and going around the corner. They turn by breaking one of their wing surfaces. So if you imagine a foil kite going along in a straight line, you turn it, what you're effectively doing is putting the brakes on one side of it. And as such, they do turn, but they fall back in the window as they do. And they're the worst for the power stopping before they go around the corner. And okay, because they've got no, no structure, so to speak. They've yeah. got no, no mast, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so to break this down in a nutshell, what you would say is that, okay, if you're a total beginner to the sport, hybrid kite kind of at the at the high d power end to give you exactly. the most safety most forgiving flight and you don't need the performance at that stage and once you are up and riding and you know where your style is going to go you can then look at the industry and decide what equipment is going to be best for you to grow into um, yeah. you know uh, it may be big air it may be freestyle it may be wave riding whatever style of riding that you're pulled towards you can gear your next purchase up to um, sort of help you along that road and help you get the most from your time on the water. Um, so yeah, um, it may even be a foil kite for, for you know, getting into foiling and things like that, you know? Um, yeah, which is a big world now, obviously. A huge range of equipment out there. Um, and also bear in mind the resale value of your stuff as well, because um, if you, uh, you know, buy stuff that's pretty full on and, quite radical you don't tend to be able to sell it as easily afterwards yeah because the market's much smaller yeah yeah so is there so if i was a total beginner and i'm walking into a shop you know is there is there one kind of what am i looking for what am i looking to i want a what kite um you want a hybrid kite and right, you want okay. um, very very uh, high levels of d power mm -hmm. you want um very very easy relaunch and you want um maximum sort of wind range um, and, and the other side of things that is worth talking about, probably not for beginners, because beginners just want a really, really big wind range, is the weight of the rider versus the type of the kite. And it's yes. not something that ever gets talked about in the industry. But from an expert's perspective, it's one of the most important things um, that you can look at in your choice of kite. And uh, I'd also say that it's... Um, it's one of those things that the industries it's such a can of worms that the industry just doesn't want to talk about it and uh, it is a very very important aspect of your riding okay so that, that's that's super interesting so can we push a bit more on that then take an analogy of um, a motorbike and a lorry an engine to drive a motorbike uh, is very different to the engine to drive a lorry and it's not necessarily about horsepower you take a, a super bike probably has um, you know, the same sort of gross horsepower as a, as a light commercial vehicle, but it's the way that power is delivered that's completely different. Um, a heavy person, a heavy rider is more like a truck. It needs torque, grunt. It needs um, lots of power at slow speeds to get it going. And because the heavier rider is heavy, once they are going, they have a lot more weight and rail grip to push the kite further forward in the window and manage that grunt. So a diesel engine for a truck is analogous to a very thick foiled, um, slow, um, grunty kite for a heavyweight kiteboarder. Conversely, a motorbike engine doesn't need any torque at all. They want control at slow speeds, but they want power at high speeds. And a lightweight rider is the same. They don't need any grunt to get them up out of the water. What they do need when they're up out of the water is control and deep power and steering at higher speeds and, and lower energy levels. And so a very fine kite with a thin leading edge, much like um, a high performance um, sea kite or a race kite or something like that, is much more applicable to the lightweight than a big grunty kite, uh, you know what I mean, for, for the more expert rider. And it's a, a big thing that you see with, um, for example, Airrush make a lot of different profile kites. It's one of the reasons that they make so many, 
is that they they try and fit them to people's weights more than than other companies and it makes a radical difference to the enjoyment of your time on the water that's really interesting because one thing that I've, that we've seen an awful lot is that a couple for example you know big oh. bloke small girl yeah they'll use the same quiver of kites yeah, yeah. one of them will really really struggle yeah. and the other one will really really progress fast and it's just so, so what you're saying basically is that the same kite will not perform the same for the same person it's you've no, got to customize no. the kite to you so sharing a quiver is probably a bad idea in this it, it is um you know if you get a heavyweight person a lightweight person trying to share one quiver you either go for a compromise of kite for them both or one person's got the ideal and the other person's just going to fight take a, a light wind uh, lady who uses a um uh, a really powerful kite you see them get up almost immediately, and as soon as they're on the rail, they're overpowered. They're using the maximum amount of D-power. And a lot of kites, when they're on full D-power, you can't steer them because the back lines have gone slack. You try and steer it, and nothing happens. You've got to then sheet the bar in in order to get some steering, and that gives them a power spike they just can't handle. And so it's almost physically impossible for them to kite surf. Conversely, if you get uh, something like an Aerosh Diamond, which is a very flat profile kite, give that, uh, or a race kite, or something similar to an expert heavyweight, they'll come in and say, can't get it going, won't go. And they've kind of got a point, because there's no power there at slow speeds. Even if you fly the thing around like a crazy wasp, to get them up to the kind of top end speed that they need to develop the power. And if they make one mistake, they'll drop off the, off the rail, and they've stopped again. It's a bit like trying to power a truck with a two-stroke motorbike engine. It's just virtually Not impossible. work. Yeah. Well, that's fair, because one thing that we get asked, what we see an awful lot is a lot of women, and they see, you know, the Diamond or Cabrina of the Siren, haven't they? And they say, well, what's the difference? Is it just a gimmick? You know, is it just a pink kite for girls? That's a, a very poignant question, because, um, you know, it, it, um, some are, um, just color changes, other are complete redesigns. And uh, from somebody who, I mean, graphics are very important, but somebody who's a, you know, works with equipment and, and um, looks at the design side of it, 100%, it has to be different equipment, you know, it really does. And the diamond is different equipment, I'm assuming. It's, it's radically different to everything else they make. Yeah. If you, so it's not over, just the razor yeah. rebuild. If you're over 70 kilos, it just won't work. If you could break kite design down, because I'm assuming it is possible for you to go onto the beach and look at a kite and tell more or less how it's going to perform. So what, <clears> you say, what would you say is the single most important aspect of kite design for someone looking at this, you know, looking at kind of kites and what they want to do? Is there, is there one thing that kind of overrules everything else or is it just a mix match of everything? You can tell a lot by looking at a kite in the sky, but the one primary thing that tells you how a kite's going to feel and how it's going to work you cannot tell by looking at it. Interesting. And that's the profile of it. And that's exactly what we've just been talking about. Whether it's going to be a grunty kite or its power is going to come from what we call apparent wind, so board speed. So once you're up and riding, then the power kicks in. Like an engine that develops no power at low revs, but lots of power at high revs. You can't tell that until you physically get up close to the kite and have a look at the thickness of the leading edge and how much curve there is in the profile of the kite from there backwards it's it's actually a function of where that kite is going to sit in the window and that's why you get a lot of power when you dive the kite because it's moving back into the window where there's a lot more aspect hitting the wind straight on when you leave the kite alone and depower it it moves to the front of the window so there's less area shown to the wind and so it develops less power whether a kite is efficient or inefficient determines how much power it's going to develop at a certain time but um, it's kind of a simplistic way to say because if it's inefficient it develops a lot of power and you need a lot of weight therefore to resist that and that weight and resistance will therefore push it forwards in the window and make it more efficient so the it's the depth and, and curvature of the kite that actually give it um it, its primary characteristic so would I be right in thinking, because profile is, is as, I, as I understand it, is kind of a line drawn from the, the very tip of the leading edge to the very tail of the trailing edge. And it's an imaginary line drawn through that, that part of the kite. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you, if you take um, 
the line from the middle of the front tube to the trailing edge, the kite will have um, a curvature um, yes. on its yes. outside edge. Now, the, the bigger that curvature is, the more exaggerated it is, the further back in the window it's going gonna, it's gonna to fly and the more powerful it's going to be. Because um, it's close to the power zone. Exactly. Yeah. And um, the, a race kite at the leading edge, if it has a much flatter profile to the end, it's going to be much more efficient. So it's going to sit for, further forward in the, in the window. And so its power is going to come from speed, where speed creates extra resistance through the wind and pushes the kite essentially further back in the window where it's going to develop more power. Um, it's, okay. it's a kind of it's complicated. It's very, once you get your head around it, in terms of uh, you, you feel riding, you can kind of understand where all this um, comes from. Yeah, there are loads of other secondary things that happen in terms of the handling of the kite, mm -hmm. but it all boils down to where, for any given weight, that kite's going to sit in the window. So, yes, yeah, so that makes perfect sense. So, so whatever we're talking about, really, the, the one thing that you've got to focus on is when the kite's above your head, how, how sort of above your head is it, and, or how yeah. far back is it sat? Because the further yeah. back it sits naturally, the closer it is naturally to the yeah. power. And yeah. that's going to influence everything else, from yeah. rebounds, yeah. jumping, yeah. to upwind performance. Yeah. And that's just something that you tell by flying, basically. You can have, have you have to ask somebody who's flown it, or fly it yourself, or if you're not good enough to know, ask somebody who has flown it who does have the knowledge. And that's the only real way you can tell. Or you can read the blurb, but yeah. the blurb on companies' promotional material is somewhat generic these days and yes, yeah, it's all yeah. the best this that the other yeah, yeah it's yeah. better than last year and but the fundamentally big differences um year on year um yeah and interestingly enough the big fat kite that's not very good at sitting at the front of the window sits at the back of, back of the window on d power and you know people say about this kite has power just by pulling the bar in mm -hmm. but it doesn't have any power when it's sitting at the back of the window because it's d power with the bar out but because it's at the back of the window, you sheet it in, the power's there instantaneously. If it's efficient like a race kite, it's sitting at the front of the window, you sheet the bar in, well, it's already at the front of the window, so there's no power there. That's why the more efficient kites are more difficult to ride for beginners, because you have to move them around and get them going fast and push them down the back of the window to get the power before you can start going. So could you, could you liken profile to the effects of pulling the bar in is it the same thing or is that something totally different because by pulling the bar in are you changing the profile by pulling the trailing edge down um, well pulling pulling the the bar in is pretty much just like letting the clutch up on a car the, the energy's there in the kite as it's parked above your head much like it is in an engine when it's running and you only let the clutch up to engage that power or shut it off by pushing the clutch back in again if the kite sits down the back of the window so it's um, you know, a big, thick profile kite, and it's sat down the, the back of the window. Effectively, you've got an engine that's sitting at high rev, so there's a lot of energy stored in the engine. But when you let the clutch up, you're releasing a lot of energy. But if you've got a very fine profile kite, like a race kite, it's sitting at the front of the window, it's only ticking over, it's only idling. So you let the, the clutch up, you pull the bar in, well, there's not much power there mm -hmm. to start with, so you're not gonna get much of a spike. And that's probably a closer yeah, analogy. that's a better analogy to it. Yeah, that makes sense. So what we're basically saying, I suppose, is that you cannot, if you're if you're looking at buying a new kite, you cannot go on what your mate says. You've got to try the thing first. And bear in mind as well, your mate may be twenty kilos heavier than you. Mm -hmm. In which case, his opinions are completely irrelevant to you being a lot lighter, because you're going to say, "Well, how grunty is it?" He's going to say. Yeah, it's not that grunty, but he's 20 kilos heavier, so he's not going to notice the grunt. You get on it, it's going to rip your arms off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As I've seen various times, not actually ripping arms off, but close to it, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, it can be complicated. You really, if you want to get it right, it's, it's good to speak to somebody who kind of understands how it all works and, and has flown the kite. Um, Which explains why my 56 kilo girlfriend does not get on with my who's 90 kilo kites <laughs> and her constant moaning about it, which makes yeah. sense. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's move on to some, because that's, that's Dave quite deep into that. And I'm sure yeah. that's really useful for some people. I'm sure some people it's just gone straight over the head. It doesn't matter. It's not important. Again, just take the, 
the elements that we've, we've the applicable elements out of yeah, yeah, the most yeah. important thing, I suppose. So future kiting innovations, you know, what yeah. are we going to be riding in five years time? Oof, that's a very deep question. And I think um, I'd be the most valuable man in kiteboarding. If <laughs> that. Having said that, um, you know, looking at past history, um, the innovations that have come have been driven uh, half by invention and half by the bigger names and companies really getting behind it and pushing it. Um, I think foiling has got a long way to go. And I think we're going to see foiling diverge away from mainstream kiteboarding into virtually, it is already a discipline on its own. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and a fantastic discipline it is. Um, I think big air is definitely coming back. In fact, just recently, uh, yesterday, somebody told me that um, big air as a sort of discipline has now fractured away from the freestyle tour and has been taken up by the strapless um, wave riding tour. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, um, you know, they're planning a lot of big air next year. And also the, the locations that have um, not renewed their contest meetings for freestyle have now renewed it for big air. So it seems that the public um, appetite for the older style of riding with the new Megaloops added is definitely coming back. We had the PKRA here a couple of years ago and, and they, I forget his second name, Toby, the guy who runs Kite Forum. Yeah. Toby the, Bromwich, is it? Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he blew every, I mean, he didn't win it, but he was just doing these big loopy yeah. jumps and his crazy air style and things, and people loved it. People loved it. And then, yeah, well, there you go. and the big air competition, everyone was down the beach. Yeah. But for the freestyle, there was a few people at the beach, but most of the kiters were actually 200 yards away kiting yeah. because it's just so, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from freestyle, but it's, as an, as an observer, it's so, technical and so fast what they're doing it's so difficult to follow mm. whereas it's, you can watch someone going really fast or jumping really high yeah. and you don't need to know anything about it just wow that's awesome yeah it's achievable in most public riders mind they see this big air stuff and they think do you know what that's not a million miles away from what i could have the ability to do but freestyle is just so unbelievably technical and it is, like you say, take nothing away from it. It's a, it's a pinnacle of the sport. Mm -hmm, for sure. But for 99% of the public, it's an unachievable pinnacle. Yeah. And it just doesn't resonate as, as well with them. So. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the, the Lewis Craven peer jump. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the number of views that's got on. Yeah. on yeah. You. I, mean, I remember my accountant rang me up the next day and said, have you seen this? Have you seen this? this is amazing. Just because that's what grabs the public's attention. I mean, I'm not suggesting people go and jump peers. But... Mm -hmm. um, it was it was probably the best publicity the kite surfing's had in the last twenty years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that probably wraps most of it up. Um, I would say though that um, you know kite boarding as a sport, um, it's got a massive amount for me personally. I mean, it's the one sport that stuck with me from the beginning, sort of ninety nine. Was it 20, uh, 2018 now? So that's eighteen years in the sport. Nineteen years, <laughs> and. Um, I've picked up and put down a lot of other sports, normally on a five year cycle, snowboarding, mountain biking, road biking, um, loads of different other stuff. But kiteboarding's every five years kind of reinvented itself into something new. And it's the one sport that I will prioritize my time to participate in. And so even though it's um, a difficult um, sort of thing to, to, to get into it's not the the most radical uh, learning curve out there you know it's not a video game once you get a hold of it it'll be with you for a long time i, I always say that to people because you know it's um it, it's a it's a beautiful thing to do yeah uh, you know well, I'd, I'd urge you to get into it if you're not into it already absolutely and, and the, the key thing for me about it is is this we've got we taught a few years ago we taught an 80 year old woman to kite surf wow and there's a couple that regularly come down the beach and they are 83 and 84 and i mean if you've been to tree if you know what it's like in in a levante they come down 30 knots of wind they pump up their kites they launch each other they go out they don't do anything crazy mm. but every day they're out but 83 and 84 and that's, that's what really nice. appeals to it to me is that you can do this forever it doesn't it doesn't have to be a sport that you do for 10 years and then oh i'm too old for that now this is something that yeah. you no. can push it as hard as you want or you can you can sit back and cruise yeah no, out there in the ocean it's a beautiful place to be exactly 
Perfect. Thank you very much, Mike. Much appreciated. Thank you for your time. That was awesome. Pleasure. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. I certainly enjoyed recording it and I learned a ton from it. I hope you did too. Mike is the fountain of knowledge when it comes to this. I will certainly be getting him back on the podcast again in the future. So if you've got any questions on this kind of more technical nature of kit, feel free to drop me, drop me them over. I'll stick them in the hopper and I'll be sure to ask him the next time I have a chat with him. If you're interested to see more about the brands that Mike works with, the links are in the show notes below. But just to summarise, it's Airrush and Shin. As always, guys, if you want more information on anything today, check out our website, www.tantrumkitesurf.com. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next episode. Cheers, guys.